A lot has changed in the last two years. Back then, COVID was a novel disease that we didn't know too much about or how to treat. Fast forward to now, and that's no longer the case. Let's go over seven ways the science and our understanding of COVID has evolved. Plus, I'll share what those changes mean for how we prevent transmission, what's outdated and what's not, and why most countries are unlikely to see lockdowns again. One, symptoms. At the beginning of the pandemic, checking for symptoms like a dry cough or a fever was a go-to spread prevention strategy. That was in large part because we thought only people with symptoms could spread COVID. We now know that people without symptoms can definitely spread COVID. Plus, since then, we've learned that the data on symptom checks is murky. Epidemiologists don't know how well daily questionnaires work at catching potential cases. That's because they're only as good as people's honesty. Plus, there's very little scientific evidence that temperature checks alone do anything to prevent transmission. That's because many people don't get a fever or are asymptomatic. Two, tests. Back in 2020, tests were really hard to come by. There were long lines at testing sites and only people with certain symptoms could get tested. While we've experienced more recent testing shortages, at-home rapid tests are now available to practically everybody, especially if you can afford to buy them yourself. Some employers are giving their workers test kits so they can swap themselves regularly or when they have symptoms. The federal government has also made them available for free. Plus, rapid tests are currently covered by insurance. Three, treatments. Better access to rapid tests has made the long-awaited test-to-treat strategy for COVID prevention possible. In April 2020, that wasn't an option because at-home treatments didn't exist. Since then, pharmaceutical giants Pfizer and Merck have come out with anti-COVID pills that reduce the risk of hospitalization and death. And the earlier they're taken, the better. With these new antivirals available at pharmacies, people who test positive can immediately start taking these pills at home without needing to go to the hospital. In March, the Biden administration launched the Test to Treat program to make these pills more widely available through local pharmacies, nursing homes, and community health centers. Now we also have vaccines. These three things together, testing, antivirals, and vaccines, lower our collective risk. And they're the reason why, at least in the US, we're unlikely to see lockdowns again. Four, clean air. The emphasis on clean air is arguably the biggest update to our public health guidance on COVID transmission. When the pandemic started, public health experts thought that transmission happened through large respiratory droplets that fell out of the air within three to six feet. The thinking was that for the virus to transmit, these large virus-laden droplets had to land on somebody's eyes, nose, or mouth, and from there, the virus would infect your cells. Now we know that the virus is airborne, meaning it can float around in the air for a long time and over distances longer than six feet. So now, airflow experts say that upgrades to a building's ventilation and air filtration systems are key to preventing the spread of COVID, even more than they thought at the beginning of the pandemic. Five, social distancing. Remember the three to six feet we were talking about earlier? One hallmark of the early pandemic response were markers and signs telling you to keep that distance from other people. That stemmed from how we thought the virus spread through those large respiratory droplets that I mentioned earlier. In some places, like the train or maybe your office, some of that signage remains. And that's because social distancing helps, to an extent. But infectious disease experts say that it's less about distancing and more about density. Fewer people means less virus floating around in the air, which means lower risk of transmission. That's why crowded spaces are still potential hotspots for spread, especially if they're not well ventilated or the air isn't filtered. Six, masks. The guidance on masking has been influenced in part by supply chains and the realization that the virus is airborne. In early 2020, masks were really hard to come by, especially the N95 variety, which are the best masks of all. So public health experts, including Anthony Fauci, said that the general public didn't need to wear masks. That changed in early April 2020, when the Trump administration asked people who lived in COVID hotspots to wear cloth masks on a voluntary basis. Since then, multiple studies have shown that wearing masks indoors lowers the risk of transmission. Recently, several states have done away with their mask mandates, including in schools, due in part because of the availability of vaccines and lower case counts. Infectious disease experts warn that if cases pick back up, we may need to put them back on, especially indoors or if other precautions aren't in place. Seven, hygiene. 
Another big early pandemic prevention strategy was cleanliness. Think back to the shortages of hand sanitizer and wipes. We used to think that the virus could survive on surfaces for a long time because there were early studies that showed viral genetic material on surfaces. That turned out to be just remnants, not live virus capable of infecting. There's a very low risk of catching COVID through contaminated surfaces. By some estimates, it's one in 10,000. A lot has changed since the beginning of the pandemic, and it's important to remember that no one protocol is going to keep us infection-free. Plus, we need to stay flexible as COVID waves go up and down.